Parliament House has been having with all eight candidates for the position of Director General of the WTO to, to better understand their stances on the challenges to global trade. And so last about his vision for the future of the WTO. Before I introduce uh, the ambassador, perhaps just a few house rules. The, the first house rule, ironically, is that we are not under the Chatham House rule today. Uh, we're on the record uh, and we are recording this event. It can be viewed later on the Chatham House website. If you'd like to tweet, therefore you can uh, under the handle hashtag CH events. Um, after I have asked a few questions of the ambassador uh, for the first 15, 20 or so minutes, um, please ask questions yourself using the, the Q&A function, not the chat of a raised hand, hand function, they've been disabled. Um, and ideally, you, you can ask the question yourself. If you don't wish to, that's fine. I will ask it for you. Just, just let me know. But we'll unmute you if you do. You are muted right now. Um, but to begin with, uh, I will ask uh, several questions myself along the lines that have been done for the previous candidates who have been, uh, who've been uh, in this series here. <clears throat> Um, now let me introduce uh, Ambassador Ulyanovsky uh, in full. Um, he has been one of Moldova's top diplomats for a decade now. Uh, in recent times, he has risen to a Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2018 to 2019. Prior to that, he was Moldova's ambassador to Switzerland, which of course also means being the key representative to all the international organizations located there, including, of course, the WTO. Uh, in academic terms, Mr. Ulyanovsky has a PhD in international law, and he has specialized in the so-called frozen conflicts of, which beset the region, which I'm personally very keen to ask him about, but really cannot hear. It's not quite a, on topic. So we'll have to do that uh, another time. Uh, but in the meantime, Ambassador, welcome and, and thank you. And let's, let's make a start here. Um, perhaps I could ask you a really general question at the outset, sir. Um, your, really, which, it's about your, your overarching attitude to global trade, your philosophy for global trade. How does it how does it engender prosperity in your view? Perhaps what are its limits? And how do you see that sort of delicate balance between over-regulation and non-regulation? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, James, for this uh, very kind introduction. I appreciate that and always uh, honored uh, uh, to be with Chatham House. Uh, and of course, uh, today's conversation is important as well for, uh, for the entire world, but also particularly for the multilateral trading system. I am strongly in favor of the world, of the world free, fair trade, and I'm a strong supporter of multilateral uh, trade system. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, in the course of its existence, the WTO has done good for uh, its members, and uh, I'm sure that it will continue to do so. And nevertheless, uh, having said that, I am a strong believer of the fact that uh, any organization uh, in the world today needs to adapt to the 21st uh, century realities. And that includes uh, the ongoing challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the financial crisis. Uh, there is a rise of uh, protectionism measures on the national level. And I believe that overall, we do need a, uh, an organization that is a rules making an organization that has also a mechanism on how these rules, first of all, are negotiated by members, second, are followed and third, have a system of uh, analyzing and, and uh, uh, the cases or disputes of breaching or potential breaches of the system. And from that point of view, I think it's a very holistic approach. And uh, I would say to, to everyone that it's better to have a system than not having a system. So the question is not if to have or not, but is the question is, how would you adapt? Because I strongly believe there is a need for reform, for a deep reform of the organization. And that is, a, I think, an overarching priority. The philosophy would be that we would need to increase the level of economic development of people. Because today, we have a situation when WTO, in the course of its existence, has managed to help lots of people to get out of poverty. But still, there is a big number of, uh, of communities globally especially in the least developed countries and some of the developing members facing with these challenges. And from this point of view, I would say that uh, the negative impact of COVID-19 has highlighted the inequalities today and WTO is more relevant and necessary than ever. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador. That, that is a, a great opening statement, and perhaps I could just feed from it. Um, you mentioned that you were a, a, a strong advocate of free and fair trade. So perhaps I'm just, just building on that, can I just ask you, do you think that free trade is always fair trade? And what, what I, I mentioned something about the limits earlier, um, because obviously not everybody has benefited from the advances in global uh, in the global trading system. Some people in, the, in some countries, in developing countries, could be said to have been moved into poverty by, uh, by it. So just, just tell me a little bit about, about where the limits are. If you were to remove, for example, all subsidies immediately, then there would be, there would be problems. There's a more, perhaps a more gradual removal of subsidies is the way forward. So, so I'm just asking a little bit about the limits because as I say, under over-regulation causes problems, but under-regulation surely causes problems as well. Well, again, if you go to the extremes, I think that it's, it, it, it will not work uh, either way. So everywhere is about finding the right balance between, uh, between how, how, fast, how fast to make the uh, trade flows free. And I think that always has been and will be for a while a working progress uh, for the WTO. And uh, particularly from this perspective, I think that it's very important to focus or to refocus the organization to benefit those that have not fully benefited or have not fully integrated into the multilateral trading system. And I believe that we need to focus on capacity building on the ground for those members that have not felt or are feeling that there is a risk for opening up too fast and too soon uh, not being able to uh, deal with the competition. And from that point of view, I think we need to be very careful because of the, as I mentioned, the negative impact of the pandemic and the financial crisis on the major industries. And I'm not saying only about the global value chains in goods or trading, but also trading services. And from the same point of view, I think we need to focus the, uh, the work of the organization to better communicate the advantages while also understanding the limits of its activity because we have also the uh, national governments that have their own national sovereignty. And from that point of view, the organization needs to strengthen the capacity of the LDCs particularly, but also to encourage those that have various regional formats of cooperation and or agreements that their benefits are multilateral and everyone benefits from, uh, from, from any regional or plurilateral uh, dimension uh, based on the most favored nation, for example, principle uh, for the LDC members. And I would strongly uh, be in favor of uh, refocusing the work of the organization for supporting the uh, MISMEs and SMEs, the micro, small and medium enterprises. Because in the vast majority of the WTO members, the SMEs and MISMEs comprise more than 90, sometimes 95, 97% of, uh, of their economy. So I think it's very important to be able to empower them to focus not on trade barriers, but on trade facilitation uh, measures that will allow a more freer and, and uh, uh, inclusive flow of goods. Uh, from that point of view, I think that uh, this is the vision or the way to move forward. We'll have to be very clear on, on the third dimension of the uh, priorities for the World Trade Organization, and that's monitoring and transparency system. Because we have the, uh, the so-called principle of notification of national actions to the WTO Secretariat. And I think it's important to strengthen this dimension. So every member has to uh, promptly inform the organization and everybody else on the domestic measures taken. And that will also increase the transparency and inadequately will, uh, will remove or will decrease the risks for negative uh, spillover effect for, uh, for the neighbors or for the smaller and vulnerable economies. Thank you very much indeed. You referred, of course, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic that's affected us all so, uh, so extraordinarily. Um, so I suppose any candidate, uh, any, anybody who takes this job of director general is coming into the, is coming into the position at, at the most extraordinary time, uh, considering the possibility of a global recession, certainly a global turndown. Um, uh, so what role precisely, in as much detail as you can in, in your three, four minute answers, Ambassador, what role precisely can the WTO play in avoiding the worst effects of a global recession um, and, 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 and the, the ravages of COVID-19? I, I suppose, because again, I mean, just on the, previous, on the previous question, I presume that 
that members will be more active in their economies, they'll be asking for protection, and that's something you'll be battling against in some ways. Well, that, that's a very uh, good question, uh, James, but it's also a very complex uh, uh, question. Let me start with the fact, or maybe the message, that COVID-19, the way I see it and the way I think the organization members should see it, it should be seen as a wake-up call, a wake-up call for more transparency and more inclusiveness, but at the same time for more relevance of the organization. Number one, I think it's extremely important today to make sure that the facilitation of trading goods, particularly in the industrial in the, or in the uh, manufacturing uh, system, uh, should not be disrupted. And I think it's very important. Trading services, logist logistics and, and, and transportation services should not be disrupted because these are the elements or many WTO members are depending on the global value chains because they're a part of it. So from that point of view, I think it's very important from the trade dimension to make sure that there is the continued flow and where there are disruptions based on the notification system to understand on how to intervene and how to increase the national capacity. For example, the, the, the tourism industry, for example, today has been uh, uh, very much affected for many members. At the same time, dealing particularly with COVID-19 from the trade dimension, uh, we have the so-called uh, 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 flow or uh, uh, global value chains of medical equipment, EPP and medical supplies. And mm -hmm. I think it should not be fully nationalized and at the same time, we also uh, have to make sure that there is a flow of agricultural or agri-food uh, products, uh, which is of, of, of national security, I would say, uh, per, per perspective. From, from this particular dimension, I think that uh, WTO has to work much closer with the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome to make sure that there is a holistic approach to deal with COVID-19 from the medical perspective, from the trade perspective, and from the food security perspective. And uh, I, I think that uh, now, since we are also fa uh, facing or m hearing about more conversations on vaccination or vaccines uh, from different parts of the world, along with WHO efforts to identify the best vaccination method, we have to make sure to avoid nationalization of vaccination procedures mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that uh, on one hand, uh, I fully understand the capacity of some members to be able to generate or to uh, have a more increased capacity on working on this, whereas others will not have. So we have to make sure that there is a uh, as fewer barriers as possible. Going back to your question about the uh, protectionism uh, measures and look, I want to be very, very, very clear, and we have to be uh, realpolitik, as you, as, as you say also in geopolitics, uh, to understand that COVID-19 has caught uh, most of us, or if not all of us, uh, off guard. And the immediate reaction by WTO members, or some of them, or the majority of them, was to make sure, and any government has to protect its own citizens, and was to make sure that uh, they, uh, national governments, they do as much as possible to protect uh, their economies. And uh, on one hand, I understand these matters, but these matters should be promptly notified to the WTO secretariat, and they should not be seen as, as permanent measures. They should be seen, and I think that uh, the next DG should also raise awareness and encourage members to gradually reduce and or eliminate such actions. I would like to caution against the fact that, you know, there is a phrase of uh, any temporary measure has a risk of being seen. There is nothing permanent as temporary. So we have to be absolutely clear and to act in those cases when these actions of protectionism uh, nature in some members have a negative or have a potential negative effect on the economies and trade engagement and commitment of other members. So uh, uh, from that point of view, I think it's... Uh, on one hand, understandable, but we need to to, to act uh, together. Thank you. That is that is a, that is a detailed answer to a complex question indeed. And if that weren't a challenge enough, Ambassador, then I suppose you could argue that the even greater challenge than the slowdown and than than, than, than COVID nineteen is, is that of climate change and environmental degradation. The, you know, these are the, some of the principal sustainable development goals of the of the UN. So I suppose what is the connection you see between global trade and sustainable development? Uh, how do you, uh, is there a tension you see when you consider that, that for global trade to function effectively, you need, you need air traffic, air traffic can, uh, um, causes so much pollution, particularly freight traffic, commercial, uh, commercial and trade traffic. 
So how do you how do you resolve that tension when you, on the one hand, need to bolster the economies, to, uh, but at the same time, we're working towards a, a slightly frictious um, goal of effectively saving the planet? Do you see these things in competition with each other, or can you, in some in some way, connect uh, your goals and your mission to the to the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Well, that, that's that's a good question. I think we have all of us have to think about how making sure or at least making the effort that uh, the trade discussion and the SDGs or 2030 UN agenda uh, have to be seen as complementary to, to each other. On one hand, the national governments had taken the commitment towards or as members of the UN to fully implement the sustainable development goals. On the other hand, I, I fully understand where, where you, you're heading with the talk of, of, of trade and trade may not be fully ready or trade members may not be fully ready to, 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 you know, to uh, switch to the, uh, for example, all green uh, industries methods that takes time. And, and I think the WTO itself could not deal with that. It has to be an, an overarching effort together with other agencies, particularly uh, uh, UNEP uh, from the UN uh, system and others as well. Uh, but let me tell you uh, several examples what I think about uh, ongoing negotiations. And we have one ongoing negotiation at uh, the multilateral negotiation within the WTO and that's the fishery subsidies. Uh, which I think is a very important uh, uh, topic, not only for WTO, but also for the UN SDGs, because the uh, fishery subsidies uh, elimination, especially on the uh, uh, IUUs, are particularly record in, port in, uh, in point 14.6 uh, of the 2030 agenda. So that is a part of WTO's role in implementing or helping members implementing the UN 2030 agenda. Nevertheless, this is also a, a, an environmental component here. And when we talk about the uh, plastic waste, for example, there is this notion, and I think we need to uh, strengthen the work of WTO on dealing with circular economy. And I have uh, particularly spoken with countries uh, from uh, Latin America, but also from Africa. And I know that countries like Senegal and, and others uh, are using the plastic waste and recycling it in, uh, for example, making the PPE, you know, uh, pr pr face protection um, um, elements, uh, while also using or reusing the plastic taken from the oceans. So I think that's something that we have to work together and WTO can uh, benefit from the idea of circular economy and to make sure that it also increases or being seen as an empowerment tool for the at the, at the national uh, grassroots level in the least developed members. Thank you. Um, you referred in a, your answer to a previous question, Ambassador, uh, to um, think about the nationalize of what need of needing to avoid the nationalization of vaccines, and I it sort of made me think about the. Uh, the differences in some ways between different approaches to uh, globalization we're currently seeing. Um, you come from a European country, in my opinion. Uh, in fact, I consider Moldova to be a European country as a matter of fact, as everyone may. Um, and uh, I suppose I'm asking, where do you see, in what areas are the US, which has been fighting against this in, so, so in, in ways recently, against multilateral organizations, um, and Europe aligned. Where are, where are the US and, and EU aligned? And where are the major differences between Europe and the US? Well, I, I believe, and I've had conversations with uh, both uh, Washington, Brussels, uh, uh, Paris, Berlin, and, and other uh, important capitals within the European Union, as well as with, uh, with Asian capitals, such as Beijing and Tokyo and others. And I, I see on the fundamental level that uh, uh, while there are concerns expressed uh, by, uh, by the major players with regards to the fact that the current system is not uh, fulfilling or is not seen as fully beneficial for them, I think on the more fundamental level, uh, all of them, they are in favor of a multilateral system. So I think it's a good foundation to build upon. Second, we are also unfortunately facing an unprecedented level of uh, trust or mistrust, I would say, within the organization. Uh, and we have not seen any, uh, which has been expressed in no non-existent uh, de facto uh, uh, negotiations at the multilateral level within the organization. Uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, some of the uh, concerns expressed by uh, both the European Union and by the United States, uh, particularly, I think, are important to be better understood uh, with regards to the dispute settlement system of the organization, because this is also a judicial arm of the organization, and which I think is, uh, is extremely important to, uh, for the next DG to be able to deal at the political level to increase the political will or to generate it. Uh, so there is uh, the will to engage in negotiations on how to restructure, restructure the dispute settlement system of the, uh, of the WTO, including the appellate body, but also the entire system. Uh, that would be one element. The second element would be also the uh, ongoing negotiations at the plurilateral level uh, on e-commerce or digital trade. And here I think it's extremely important, in my opinion, uh, today, more than ever, and COVID-19 has proven it, that uh, e-commerce or digital trade should be made as an empowering tool. But here we, answer, we enter in different dimensions of digital trade, of data protection, on intellectual property uh, protection and regulation. Uh, you have the moratorium on, 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 uh, on, on uh, customs duties for electronic transfers and, and so forth. And uh, these are elements, I think there are details, but very important details, because these details are important for the businesses uh, from both the US, the European Union and others. So we need to uh, avoid the situation of the vacuum of rules. We need to have rules and regulations. Where we don't have rules at this point, uh, this is where the issues start. And I think that the concerns expressed particularly by the United States are reflecting the fact that we do not have rules where they should be, or we are not implementing some of the existing rules. And uh, I think this is uh, something that, uh, from my perspective, of course, it's a member-driven organization. So members will have to mm -hmm. uh, decide for themselves where and in which negotiations to engage. But it's good that at DG level, uh, the director general understands that there is a good foundation. And in my case, particularly knowing the issues as, as a former ambassador to the WTO, but also having the political experience on how to deal with leaders, I think that's important because today, besides the trade issues, unfortunately, within the organization, we have a, uh, an increased level of politicization, politicization of many issues. That's very interesting. And, and considering those challenges, I mean, it's not entirely clear. Do you consider the challenges to the WTO and the global trading system, do you consider them to be primarily technical or primarily political in nature? Well, uh, the, the obvious answer, of course, is, uh, is a bit of both. Uh, at, at the same time, at the same time, I would more incline to the uh, political dimension. Uh, and that is why I think that uh, as a former ambassador, I know that the instructions to the uh, to Geneva based ambassadors are coming from the capitals and the ca in capitals. There are different governments and these governments are responsible to their own citizens. So from this point of view, I think it's very important that the next DG has this combination of political and plus technical. At the same time, I would not say that everything or uh, all the issues have a political reason of existing. Uh, sometimes I would even encourage to have a more open mind on the technical negotiations. Uh, and we have uh, a similar situation within the organization where we have uh, so-called the unfinished business negotiations on agriculture, on market access, uh, domestic support, uh, uh, export, export competition, and so forth. And these negotiations have not moved for the past almost 20 years. And sometimes you would need to have uh, both technicians coming with new approaches and new ideas uh, on how to deal with the unresolved or older issues. But for that to happen, and I want to be very clear here, in my opinion, we would need to, to get things moving, we would need to have the political will. And that's why the first actions of the next DG should be of a political character. Super, thank you very much indeed. I want to come in myself at the end again, because I have a question about, about the post-Soviet region. I, can't, I just can't help myself. It's my own, uh, it's my own training, sir. But uh, I am obligated to, and it would be very good to hear from people who know much more about uh, this and the global trading system than I do. So I'm going to turn it over to questions from the audience and ideally bring them in. Um, so uh, Ewan Grant, who I know very well, because he's a good friend of Chatham House, um, is the first on my list and has a question about um, the relationship with other, uh, 
other international organizations. I wonder, Ewan, if, we, if I could um, in, entreat you to ask the question yourself, please. If not, don't worry, I will do it, but we will try to unmute you. If I don't hear from you in five seconds, I'll ask it myself. Am I unmuted? You are, Ewan. Indeed. Good to, Good to hear from you. Yeah, well, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I speak as someone who's worked on international programs in Moldova. Uh, James, right at the start, made the point about your experience being accredited to Swiss-based international organizations. How do you see working with them both at a political and what we might call operational level? We've seen major international scandals over the years, and I can't help feel um, that WTO has a key role in bringing some of those together or bringing the handling of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. Well, th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ewan, for, for, for uh, this question. And I think it one more time uh, confirms my, my previous position and expressed it as well, that WTO cannot or does not uh, exist in a vacuum. Uh, it, it exists, even if it's not a member of the United Nations system, it has to, uh, I don't want to say it's blessed or doomed, it's just a reality. It must uh, cooperate with all, or all of the relevant organizations. When I say relevant, and you mentioned the Geneva-based or Swiss-based uh, agencies, particularly, of course, we have the, uh, and I mentioned about the work together with the World Health Organization, and to make sure that the actions are targeted uh, on, on uh, not disrupting or making sure that the vaccination and the medical supplies are, 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 uh, are, are flowing freely and are available to everyone and that uh, facilitating measures are being taken. At the same time, I would say that we have to, WTO uh, also uh, needs to work with agencies or with uh, uh, conferences, for example, like UNCTAD, uh, not, not to replace the work, but to work together. And while in Geneva, I was also for the first time the president of the Trade and Development Board uh, of UNCTAD. And in that capacity, I have particularly made aware, made, uh, was made aware of the uh, enormous information uh, from many reports coming from this organization. And uh, in that capacity, I have worked with LDCs and, and some of the developing members. So I think that some elements some information uh, on the on the on the ground level. I think it's important uh, to be used to increase the efficiency of the operational arm of the WTO, and that inc includes the negotiations uh, and negotiations based on facts from the local from the local uh, uh, authorities or, or uh, regions. Uh, we have the situation with migration, even if it's even if it's not connected to the uh, to the WTO per se but trade uh, affects the economies and economies might affect the increased or decreased level of migration from a country to a region uh, looking for a better life. So from that perspective, I think it's also important. Uh, we didn't mention about the financial institutions. And I think that WTO needs to, uh, well, it has a good track record, but we need to fully capitalize the potential of working together with the World Bank, IMF, Financial Stability Board, uh, especially today, to make sure that there is liquidity available to uh, the vulnerable economies. Liquidity that should be made, in my opinion, uh, available as fast as possible and, uh, let's say, at, at the lowest cost as possible to these uh, vulnerable economies to be able to quickly uh, um, uh, readjust their economic uh, development and be able to uh, safeguard and, and, and to protect their economies. Uh, having said that, of course, we have the International Trade Center that we have to work with, and I think that has been a good experience working with the previous leadership and I'm sure with the current leadership. We have the WIPO, the Intellectual Property Organization, and I was the Vice President uh, of the General Assembly of WIPO, and I think it's important, especially in the intellectual property discussions uh, on the TRIPS amend amended agreement, uh, the WTO needs to work together here. So uh, WTO, in my opinion, has to work multi-dimensionally with each of the UN agencies, not taking its role, but benefiting from information, but also from the or joint work where necessary. Thank you.
Um, I'm conscious that we have, time flies, doesn't it? But we have really only about 15 minutes left and there's at least three or four questions still to get through. So I could ask you just a, a slightly shorter answer so I understand that that last question did demand a very full answer. The next question is, uh, hopefully again, we can unmute you. It's from Mahesh Kotech, who has a question about the role of um, African Continental Free Trading Organization. Mr. Kotech, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for your extensively uh, uh, comprehensive, I would say, and uh, obviously very well informed answers. I'm very impressed with your uh, the depth and breadth of your knowledge and experience. Um, my question is related to Africa. As you know, the Continental Free Trade Agreement has uh, recently been kicked uh, forward. It's not yet. Uh, uh, started because of COVID-19. Uh, one of the contexts of its implementation in Africa is that the COVID-19 situation has disrupted massively supply chains, not only in Africa, but elsewhere. Therefore, there's a lot of talk that I hear from my conversations, fairly uh, wide conversations with the financial sector, uh, both commercial and uh, supranational, uh, re regional supranationals or sub-regional even, uh, massive interest in, in uh, uh, local production, especially of light industrial goods and agri agricultural products processing um, to have more self, uh, uh, let's say, reliance. Um, this at a time when intra-African trade is already pretty low, it's around 18 or you know, mid, mid teens percent compared to 60 in Euro, European Union. How do you view this? And would you be supportive of that? And do you think that is consistent with the, what WHO is seeking to do with regional trade organizations like uh, um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Thank you. Please, sir. Somebody's frozen. I don't know if it's me or you. Mr. Katecha or, or, or Emily or back in Chatham House, can you hear me? No, I've frozen. Okay. Let's see if it comes back. Uh, no, I think. Yes, hello. Ah, we've got you. I'm not sure who got frozen there, but uh, did you get the, did you get Mr. Katecha's question? Yeah. Ambassador, did you hear Mr. Katesha's question? Can you hear me? I apologize because uh, you were frozen. Yeah, uh, and in fact, I'm not sure who was frozen, in fact. Can you hear me? Ambassador? Uh, yes, I can hear you, but your, your, video yes, is your, signal, your signal is fluxing in and out. Um, perhaps you can remove your camera or we can try to. Can you hear? It might be better without your camera. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Super, fantastic. I think it might be better this way. Um, it's your signal, I understand. Um, did you get Mr. Katech's question about the role of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the, the general reaction in Africa to COVID-19, et cetera? Can, did, can, you, can you respond to that question? Ah, we are still losing you. I am, I, I am back now, so I can hear you now. Okay, can you answer Mr. Katech's question, Ambassador? Did you, did you hear it? Uh, no, I heard just uh, just about the the uh, African African uh, uh, trade agreement, but maybe you can summarize it. If Very you roughly, the question was uh, about your view on Africa and the role of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the general reaction in Africa to COVID-19 and the increased commitment to local production where possible in lieu of imports on account of the disrupted international supply chains. Okay, well, uh, I think it's a very pertinent question, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I had several, uh, if not a lot, lot of conversations with uh, uh, almost all uh, African uh, members and uh, African countries, uh, and uh, particularly uh, I am uh, aware of the fact that the uh, role or the input uh, of, of uh, Africa and the African continent 
to the global GDP has dropped from 5% to 3%, according to my knowledge, which is already a, a measure, a, a message of concern. At the same time, I, uh, I hope that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the free trade agreement uh, would be uh, an encouraging uh, step uh, forward to uh, not only to facilitate trade and inter-African trade, not only African trade with other uh, continents and or uh, members, but also within Africa. And from that point of view, I think that uh, it should be a balanced approach. Uh, to be very honest, uh, one, one, one is uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation, in my opinion, should also be as a wake-up call for domestic governments to make sure that there is a production capacity of, uh, of medical supplies. If not, uh, uh, not, to be, not to rely only on import, which WTO needs to make sure that they are made without any barriers. But at the same time, it should be a balanced approach while also encouraging and uh, uh, helping the local producers if there is a capacity to produce a final product, if not, to make sure that, for example, and that's an idea to, uh, that I have right now, maybe, uh, to make a, a regional approach that some elements of this value chain could be made in different uh, uh, countries. So per, as, as a whole, per se, there is a final production within a certain region or within entire Africa. Thank you very much indeed. And for, and for, and for a short answer, I'm sorry about the technical troubles. Um, I'll move on to the uh, a gentleman from the Romanian embassy in London. That seems relevant, considering your proximity uh, to Romania. Um, and perhaps we could unmute Sebastian Nazaro, please. Yes, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you, James. And uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, great presentation. Um, I'm not an expert on the... Uh, economic or, or financial uh, issues. Uh, however, that, uh, that's why my questions are uh, much more broader. So my first question to you uh, regards to your vision about the WTO, um, um, how, how the WTO will balance between globalization and nationalism. Uh, would the, is the mission of the WTO to promote the globalization even though uh, often that leads to crisis and tensions around the world. And the second uh, question is, uh, in your vision, what would be the um, instruments or tools of, uh, available to WTO to uh, convince states to play by the international uh, law system and uh, by, by the WTO rules? And you know probably what countries I have in mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Please, Ambassador. Well, thank you so much for these very diplomatic questions. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, uh, but, but, and and truly, uh, truly, I think these are uh, even they are more philosophical, more strategic questions. But I think one has to deal with both technical and uh, tactical, but also strategical uh, questions. Um, from a larger standpoint, I think that look, globalization, trade, protectionism, impact. Uh, that has been a debate for a very long time, uh, number one. Number two, I think that trade has done lots of good globally. And when I know that some statistics are showing that uh, since its uh, inception, uh, the WTO and trade itself has more than one billion of people to get out of poverty. That doesn't mean that, that everything is, is, is uh, romantic or everything is great. Yes, there are still issues. And uh, uh, I would like to reiterate just one thing. I think that it's important to have a system. And WTO, in my opinion, is that organization that will or has the capacity and will have to play a, a more efficient, uh, holistic even uh, systemic role in uh, making sure that the process of a larger process of, of making trade free uh, and also in the context of uh, uh, globalization and or protectionism we have to make sure that these actions are made in a certain sequence. And this sequence is following a certain a, a commitment of those uh, countries that are members of WTO and that have accepted certain commitments. And now going to your second uh, uh, question, that uh, uh, is how to convince members to follow these rules. Well, uh, let's take a step back and let's uh, recognize that uh, the, the rules have been negotiated by WTO members. 
at the same time, it's a member-driven organization. It's a consensus-based organization. So any existing rule has been adopted with the acceptance of all WTO members and uh, who have negotiated, but also have accepted to follow these rules. The question is how you uh, or how one uh, can uh, encourage them to follow these rules. And this is what I, I think that in my capacity as, as a former foreign minister, uh, this is uh, both a political and technical dimension. So again, getting back to the political will on making sure that any action made uh, by one WTO member or several WTO members are following the rules and are not having a negative or spillover effect on the other members' economies, global value chains and so forth. At the same time, I understand, and I, I understand the position and the concerns expressed by some members, that the current rule book is not reflecting the realities of trade today. And we are talking about various uh, topics of transparency, of subsidies, of, of disputes, uh, and, and so forth. This doesn't mean that we say that everything is bad. No, some things are good, some things should be negotiated. Uh, what we do with, uh, with those that allegedly uh, are not following these rules. Well, in this case, we have the uh, current system of the dispute settlement. At the same time, the DG is limited in its capacity, by the way. The DG is, is an honest broker, is a manager. But the DG, I think, has to increase the strategic communication dimension and to raise awareness for the uh, entire organization to follow the rules and to highlight cases when that need more attention uh, from all the members. And just Thank to... Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, only because only I'm anxious to get in one final question, if, if I may, um, Ambassador, because I know we, I know you've got to go in a couple of minutes, uh, two minutes after the hour. And in fact, I'm going to make it a two-part question. One on behalf of my colleague, Creon Buckley, who's the brains behind this, uh, uh, behind this exercise of interviewing uh, uh, discussions with uh, Director General candidates, and, 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 and one for myself. So very briefly, uh, Creon Buckley is asking, what do you see as a role for non-state actors? How do you think the WTO can make more use of these actors in future? And very briefly for myself, for myself if I may, um, I'd like to ask you about, about if you see, the, I, I can't help but ask you, if you see the post-Soviet space, uh, where you hail from as being under potential as far as global, global trade is concerned, what does it mean uh, if, you, uh, if you become Director General? Because I don't think, if I'm not mistaken, anybody from a post-Soviet space has held such an influential top position in a multilateral organization before. It's quite remarkable. Two questions. So, so non-state actors and the post-Soviet space. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, James, and also Creon for uh, for your question. With regards to non-state actors, I am a strong believer, by the way, of the fact that uh, the WTO has to increase its work and cooperation, uh, and even information and uh, and strategic advices uh, from. Uh, civil society, from business sector, and I would say from uh, from a larger dimension of uh, of uh, of thinkers, strategic thinkers, and it, that includes think tanks such as distinguished uh, as Chatham House. <laughs> and congratulations on your secretarial, by the way. So um, going back, I think the the business community is a strong partner and should be uh, engaged much more, not only on those WTO public forums events, which are occasional events. And I had several conversations with the ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, and we have discussed uh, many ideas on how to get businesses on board in, in helping WTO and its members to really streamline and to make their policy and negotiations more beneficial for the larger businesses, but also for the smaller businesses and so forth. The civil society cooperation, I think it's a very important NGOs, particularly to deal with the issues of women empowerment, climate change, uh, youth engagement, youth commitment, and, and many, other, uh, many other topics, even on the COVID-19 and, and medical uh, and humanitarian situation. So I think that's very important. And in that dimension, the WTO and DG could play a very important role in communicating more actively and organizing, especially today with the digital uh, transformations, WTO has to benefit from this digital transformation to be even closer favorite uh, subject, uh, James. Uh, look, I, uh, I, I, I believe, and I'm, as I mentioned, that trade has benefited uh, WTO members, has benefited, and uh, uh, Moldova is no exception, even though we have assumed the commitments of a developed member. 
Uh, at the same time, several uh, countries uh, from the former Soviet Union are already members of WTO, are in the so-called recently acceded members, Article 12 members. At the same time, other members, uh, other uh, countries from the Soviet uh, uh, space, uh, from the Eastern Europe and larger uh, Central Asia uh, region, uh, are in the process of acceding, and they are negotiating today their commitments to become members of WTO. I would see this as an encouraging sign of the, one, belief that they want to be a part, and we want to be a part of a system that on one hand will create or will, will make sure that we are protected by some rules. There is a question about the application of these rules, but there are rules that we will be able to, uh, to follow and others will be able to follow when dealing with us on economic and trade terms. So I, see, I think that, that that's a good uh, fact that we have ongoing uh, accession negotiations. It's very important for the organization and on the larger public that WTO and to those critics that are saying that WTO is not relevant or it's facing the biggest crisis. Well, we have countries that want to join the organization. So we need to send these, these even political message that standing is increasing in size. And of course it has to adapt because uh, when you transform, you cannot uh, enter the same water of the same river twice. The, the water is always different. And I think from the larger perspective, not only the, for, the, the former Soviet Union or Eastern Europe, there are many uh, countries and regions uh, of the world that are re-emerging and they are in transition. And I think the WTO has to make sure that their transition from a uh, economy in transition to a developing and or developed status, hopefully, uh, will be made seamless or as more efficient as possible. And, and I think that, you know, in my case, coming from a small country, I understand the issues uh, faced by the smaller and vulnerable economies, while also being a European uh, country uh, and a neutral country, going back to your political uh, uh, dimension. I think it is seen, and I was told by many members, that the neutrality uh, and the honest broker expectation for the next DG is also something that I bring to the table, because they see me and I have dealt with everyone on the table without being seen as playing or driving someone's agenda. So from that point of view, I will drive the systems agenda, the WTO agenda, and uh, I will be able to speak to anyone, everyone, and hopefully bring them back to negotiating table and to clarify some issues and or initiate new negotiations. Ambassador, thank you very much. I could talk to you all day about vulnerabilities um, and protection from whom precisely, but we unfortunately can't go there due to lack of time and possibly diplomacy as well. But in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you very much for your incredibly detailed answers to these questions. You've really added to this series, the last in this series, as I say, and I wish you all the very best of luck and that of your country as well. Um, goodbye, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, James, Quirion, uh, and everybody who was here with us today. It was a pleasure, and uh, I hope to bring my contribution to the world with your help. Thank you so much. All the best. Bye-bye.